Let us talk about self-defense aspects of martial arts. Do you also mm -hmm. practice martial arts for self-defense personally? Uh, yes, that, that is something I always keep in mind, whether I'm doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or whether I'm doing um, Armitsare. Um, I always keep in mind, okay, what would, what would work in different contexts? Um, like I, I do a lot of jujitsu in the school that I go to actually is uh, Atos, um, which is very highly respected um, throughout the world um, with Andre Galvon and his wife. Um, and so like, there are things that I notice that we study and that we do, but you know, some of those techniques are uh, much more well adapted for specifically jujitsu tournaments than for self-defense. But of course, you know, if you can like, like the self-defense stuff is always way more simple than the tournament stuff. Yes. And if you, if you know um, jujitsu, jiu you're going to know like, okay, those things that really do work. And then if you're like really good, you can also do the things that are tournament specific. Um, could you, would you like to share with our viewers your belt in jujitsu? Would you like to tell oh, them? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm a purple belt. I've been um, studying jujitsu for, well, not counting this year because COVID and knee injury, but I, I've been studying jujitsu for eight years um, and I've had a lot of fun with it. I've met some incredible people and um, it's been a really wonderful experience. And you cannot train jujitsu alone at the moment, right? I mean, how could you? <laughs> this is the I, I mean, you think, I know some people who've gotten grappling dummies um, and they do drills and stuff, but um, it's always way more fun with an opponent. <laughs> of course, of course. That's right. That's absolutely true. Okay, let's go to another part of our interview because uh, you do something which may, some of our viewers are very good at riding. Could you tell us about the riding and horse and horsemanship you have been practicing as well? So one of the uh, things I've been doing is learning how to ride. And um, it's been a great activity to do during COVID because you're not going to be very close to anyone when you're riding. Um, and so I, I've been doing it for a bit over a year now. And um, I've start one of the th one of my goals with learning how to ride is to be able to do some of the sword fighting and armored combat on horseback. But riding is very much its own art in and of itself. Uh, there's so much to uh, being an equestrian. It's it's just as rigorous an endeavor as learning another martial art, um, and it's it's been a lot of fun. Um, so right now I've, I've started doing more jumps um, and jumping horses, which has been really great. And I can also say that learning martial arts has been really handy because I'm also very familiar with how to fall. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're gonna be jumping horses, it's really good to know how to, how, if you come off the horse, how to land properly. <laughs> I mean, do riders know how to fall? Do they Most learn? Most of them don't. Most <laughs> of them I don't think do. Um, there are some, like I've seen some um, training for how to fall um, that's been more geared towards people who do what's called eventing. Um, but I don't think most... Most writers don't know how to fall. Um, and I have found that to be a very invaluable skill <laughs> in my adventures with horses. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, especially if you fall in your neck or in a something or on your head or your neck will be very dangerous if you don't know how to break the fall, right? From such a height. Right. Right. Um, I think too it's helped me be a little bit like I haven't. I've never had like any serious falls. I've had horses kind of spook under me. And, you know, so I just kind of end up going off their side more than going over their head. Um, but yeah, I would say that it's a very good skill to have. I remember one of my friends when I, 
I used to play with her horses before I was really taking lessons and her horse was a Norwegian fjord. And so he was very round and very fat. <laughs> okay. And, <I> <laughs> Not only a Norwegian fjord, but a, a fat Norwegian fjord. And uh, the, the first time I trotted on him, we just had a rope halter on him and I was bareback, right? First time I trotted on him, I was bouncing and then I was kind of bounced off the horse. But because, <laughs> but because I knew how to fall, I just, you know, did a forward roll and I came up and she was like, did you do that on purpose? I'm like, no, I fell off. <laughs> we just, you know, God, this is, you know, uh, which, you know, one of my, I mean, maybe I can share it with you. I mean, it, I never forget that when I was in Mongolia and we were riding like in the steps and there are some hills and some mountains there. And then we had all Mongolian horses. They're so well trained. And then all of a sudden our guide started to go up. I, you know, I'm not a good rider. And I said, what? I can't, no. And all these Mongolians are going, really, they did like a hill. And the horses were climbing up, seriously. I'm not kidding. And then, and before I tried to get down, I said, no, I mean, come on. And the horse was going up. And then you look down and I will never forget. And you know, the Mongolian guy said, you can make it. I said, no, I'm not going to make it. Just, no, no, leave the horse. The horse will do everything. Just don't do anything. You can you imagine how I felt the whole time the horse was climbing and me? I mean, all these Mongolians who grew up on horseback and me there, <laughs> just looking down. And, so, and he kept saying, Don't look back, don't look down. Yeah, okay, but still, you know, can you imagine how I felt? This, I oh never, my gosh, yeah, he will <laughs> that never. Sounds, that sounds pretty scary, but it also sounds like quite a blast. It was, and then you know, then that's we went like up there. Of, that's then, like an experience of a lifetime. <laughs> it was seriously, and then over there, there was a long step, and then we started to ride, and I started to enjoy. Forgot that. Then on the way back, oh, we need to ride down. Yes, yes, don't worry about that. And this was even worse, right? Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Just, and these horses, I was, and when we got down, I was a bit angry, and I told him. I got these are not horses. They're like like I don't know. They're like goats. Those goats, <laughs> mountain goats. They just you know, what kind of horse are they? And he looked at me. You know, and they spoke you know very nice English. Right, put it this way. I looked at him and said, "Yeah, our horses can climb. Not like European horses. They cannot climb." I said, "Yeah, well, I understand. I, I understand <laughs> that. You know, <laughs> I never forget that. What the well, well they, they're a lot shorter and stockier too, aren't they? Yeah, they are." I think that's the reason they could do stuff like that. I mean, of course, yeah. right? Of course. Yeah. Imagine. Well, one of, one of the horses that I ride um, on a regular basis is a, a Mustang. And uh, Mustangs are basically kind of like mutts. Sometimes you get taller, bigger ones. Sometimes you get shorter ones, different. There's a lot of variety in, in conformation and everything. Um, but he's, he's pretty short and pretty stocky, but he's also like really sure-footed. And he, uh, he can, he's very maneuverable too. So it's, it's really been fun learning how to ride and then learn riding different kinds of horses. They all feel very differently depending on the individual and the breed. Oh. And what is your favorite horse to ride? Oh, <laughs> that's hard. Arm I think it depends kind of on what I want to do, but I really, there's a horse that I ride, um, in my lessons, I ride him a lot. Nobody knows exactly what breed he is. They just said when they got him, they said he was some kind of warm blood, but his name is Desi and he really likes jumping. Um, and he not only jumps, but he has a dressage background. He's just a very well, well-tempered, enthusiastic horse. And I really like riding him. <laughs> uh, why do they call them warm blood? What's the, what's the reason they do that? Ah, uh, I am not sure. I'm, a, I, I, I'm, I'm not the most experienced equestrian. Um, I think it's because they maybe are a mixture of some of the more hot-blooded horses, um, maybe from, uh, I don't know, Spain, or uh, maybe they have some Arab in them. 
Um, yes. A lot of times it seems like some of them are like mixed with thoroughbreds, um, which are also very kind of hot blooded kind of horses. Um, they're very excitable, but I guess they're warm bloods because they're not as excitable as the hotter horses. Oh, okay. Um you know, as opposed to the cold blooded horses, which are, which would be like your big drafts, like uh, Pertron or perhaps oh. the Frisian. Oh, of course. And let's uh, just go to archery. Do you practice archery as well? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. I wouldn't really say that I'm really much of an archer, but we, we've got an archery target set up here at the sculpture studio. And when we're done making our, our molds off the clays, we, uh, put the, uh, the statues in the, in, in the yard and we shoot them with our bows. <laughs> what? You make statues? You shoot at them? Well, after, so whenever you make a, a statue um, and you make a mold off of it, you end up destroying the statue essentially, oh, but you still have big enough chunks that you can, you know, set them up and shoot at them and they make great targets. <laughs> no, of course they do. What kind of a bow do you use? I use a recurve bow um, and I, I just shoot like instinctive. So I don't really have a uh, sight or anything on my bow. I just wanted to do it in a very minimalist way. It appealed to me. Do you use Mediterranean draw or thumb draw? Uh, this. <laughs> Mediterranean, yes, three finger draw, okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you place the arrow on this side, right? On this well, side. I'm left-handed, but yes. What did you say? I'm left-handed, so. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So this that makes here, it, put it here. So if I'm holding the bow, I right. put the arrow on this side. Okay, that's right. Of course, that's right. That's very beautiful. Uh, and um, yeah, what do you like about archery? Tell us. Um. I guess I like the, uh, the quietness of it. Um, it's just kind of more meditative in a way. Do you like and shooting? And I like being outside. Oh, okay. You know? Do you like shooting heavy bows or, or medium weight or light, light bows? What do you like? What do you prefer? Um, well, typically I... Because of the kinds of targets I'm using, I'm only using a 35 pound draw, um, but I've been working up to more like 50, 55 pounds. Um, but like I said, I, I, I mess with archery, but I wouldn't say like I'm an expert archer by any means. Okay, very, <laughs> very interesting. Okay, tell us a bit at the end of this interview about, um, do you also like to deal with value systems in martial arts? Like oh, I, I do. Um, I think it, they're intrinsic to martial arts. Um, it's something that very, that's very important that if you're going to be teaching martial arts, you should also have a uh, moral obligation to give some people some instruction on the proper use of force. Um, and um, that's, that's essential. Otherwise, you know, you're, you might be just training a bunch of thugs do you see that martial arts are, I mean, the values are taught enough or stressed in today's martial arts? Or do you think these values are not taken seriously? What's your opinion on that? Um, I think it depends on the school. Um, some schools are very tournament focused. And so they don't really feel like they need to. I think they, they're re very much reliant on the, um, on the, uh, inherent morals in our society to inform people. Um, but like my military martial arts, like it's, it's mandatory that we discuss certain topics um, and that we give people moral instruction. Um, the ideal of the ethical warrior is something that is very important in the military, um, especially in a modern day military where um, we have so much scrutiny um, as Americans, we want to be the good guys. Um, and if we don't hold our values, um, and, and our, if we don't live up to our values, then 
some very bad things will happen and it'll be actually disastrous in the long term for our war efforts. Um, but as far as civilian martial arts are concerned, I think um, there isn't as much explicit um, like values taught necessarily other than the examples of our coaches. Um, and how our coaches conduct themselves is extremely important to the whole culture of a school. Um, so I, I think they're essential and, but like, and while it's good too, to have like explicit classes on certain topics, it's also very important that practitioners live up to certain morals and certain standards and, and have good character. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, which values for you are very important in martial arts? Um, I, I would say like a certain sense of honor um, and mercy. Um, I think that it, it's kind of interesting. I feel like the better a martial artist you are, the more merciful you have the capacity for being. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, it's easy, it's really easy to be good enough at a martial art to hurt someone really horribly, mm -hmm. but the better a martial artist you are, the, the more willing you are and the braver you are able to be about taking those risks so that you can de-escalate a situation um, in a very merciful way with the least amount of um, injury done to other people. You know, um, I need to say that, I don't know, I, I, but I, I'm going to mention it, you know, because why not? Let's, let's call a spade a spade. Uh, before, uh, just, uh, I think it was like 10 days ago, one of my friends from um, United Kingdom, Bob, Bob Brooks, a very experienced HEMA instructor, European martial arts or Western martial arts instructor from United Kingdom. He, she, I mean, I had an interview already in this channel and many people loved it because he also talks about values, importance of values. Bob is really good martial artist. And he always stresses values. And he sent me just recently, I think he sent me some videos about on, on, I'm, I'm sure possibly you saw that. And this is, there is a Japanese fighter and normally, you know, I, as you know, I, next to wrestling and grappling, I, uh, I have been doing Kyukushin, which is a very traditional, tough style, but like Muay Thai, but traditional. But this, this guy comes from Japan. So he's, his base is different types of grappling. I don't, please don't, I don't want to mention it, but all those grappling arts, we know, he practices four of them. So you can imagine which ones are included. And he's high ranks in all of them. So you can imagine. And he started a career in MMA, and he's also a good striker. That's interesting. So everything fine. But before a fight, he uses cuss words. Very bad. Very bad. I mean, I don't speak Japanese, but I know many Japanese friends and scholars, also from Kikushin circles, the worst types of words you can imagine. Then he, excuse me, shows his finger before the fight, left and right. Then he doesn't shake hand, of course not. And now it comes. He is he, one of few fighters in, in MMA who can apply stand up armbar. Okay. So when they're, yeah, yeah. You know how difficult it is. We all know that. I mean, we all know that, but he can do that. But what he does, he yanks. So he doesn't allow them to tap, right? So in, in, he goes with yanking motion and he broke experienced fighters' arms. You see that they were yelling. And then he goes and again, showing. He makes bad signs, the one going, very bad signs, and starts to celebrate. He does it on the ground. He puts his hands here in the eyes, and he gets warning. He does, but he keeps doing it. After watching that, and, and I, I, mean, I already saw one or two, but I didn't know that it keeps going. And I just said, I seriously don't understand. Now I say it openly on this channel. This guy needs to be disqualified for life. Because I mean, what kind of, I mean, I cannot believe this. Because, you know, and then what, what, and what Bob told me was that the saddest part was not what he was doing. I don't know why he was doing that. Maybe he needs himself help. I don't know. But one, because it, because, you know what, as you know, I teach ethical leadership. And I, we always say, based on Kant, there is a universal ethics 
on the planet. This is ingrained in all human beings. If you're healthy, if you're healthy, right? I'm not talking about people who suffer from some mental disease. If you're healthy, universal ethical code in all human beings. And basically, he doesn't have it. For some reasons, I can, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know, right? But when I watched that, and then some people wrote, well, this is realistic. And I said, none of these fights, right? And I said to these guys, are realistic. Because realistic will be, if you take someone guys down, excuse me, on the street, like our French colleague said, he's black belt in BJJ, right? In French guy. Someone pulls a knife and finishes everything, right? So this is maybe realistic. So he's doing a combat sport, right? And combat sport and competition, I mean, why are you doing this? And after watching that and Bob sent it to me, I could not, I mean, I knew one of two fights. I thought, okay, maybe this guy was, I don't know. I mean, okay, he cannot make a mistake with Yankee Gombar. I mean, you give him to, to tap. And also strikes the way he, I mean, he was doing very dangerous strikes to the spine, everything you can imagine. I mean, you don't need to strike. I mean, as an experienced striker myself, I learned not to hit the, you know, the spine and say, oh, I didn't mean, mean it. I mean, no one, we are all trained, not even in Muay Thai and Kyukushi not to do that. So he did everything, everything. And after watching this, and I, I, I told Bob, and Bob said the same, said this is one thing that he does it, but another thing that when his videos are shared on some martial arts uh, forums or also historical, historical martial arts also, right? People say, wow, this is such a tough guy. And so, and accordingly, one of our members who is also a US, in the US army or was, he made a video saying that I mean, violence is not good, guys. What are you talking about, right? That's, that's, that's the reason he made, he's a paratrooper, right? An, an experienced okay. paratrooper, you know what I mean with experienced paratrooper. We don't need to go into detail, but you know what I mean. So, right. and, then, and, then, and, and then I, I you know, Shannon, when I see this, it makes me so sad. Because, you know, I teach, when I teach ethics, it's, it's like that. And there were different social experiments. You need help. Someone holds heart like that. Oh. And people start to help him, no matter in what on which continents, because we are all meant to help each other. And then I see that in, I mean, that's programmed. Human mind is programmed, irrespective of cultural background. And when you watch, when I was watching this guy, I just asked myself, what's going on in his head? I mean, excuse me, then disqualify him for life. I mean, you cannot let this guy compete like that, right? I mean, go ahead, please. Excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, a combat sport is a combat sport. Yeah, It'd be one thing if he was in a duel for his life, right? And maybe that could possibly be permissible because you're fighting for your life, maybe. Um, I feel personally like if you're, even if you are fighting for your life, um, I feel like you need to have an inherent respect for your opponent. Um, one, because that'll help keep you alive because um, you won't underestimate your opponent, but two, because it'll also um, help prevent you from uh, doing yourself a moral injury. Um, you know, if, if you are as brutal as you could physically possibly be, uh, there's a good chance that you could do yourself a great moral injury and uh, suffer some mental illness as a result later on in your life. Um, and I think that's part of why, you know, you see in Japanese culture, you see certain ethics, like, you know, you have some ideas of Bushido. Um, in nightly combat, you see ethics as far as chivalry goes. Now, like how much these things were actually applied probably depends very much on the individual and the situation at the time. Um, but I feel like an ethical um, foundation is extremely important because otherwise you're just training a bunch of homicidal psychopaths and, uh, you know, really um, force and violence has a place in society, but it's, its place is to help your society when necessary. Um, and you can't make those kinds of decisions without a strong moral foundation um, in a way that will be beneficial for society. Absolutely, yeah, that's right. Yes, absolutely. 
Thank you very much. Please, at the end of our interview, tell us about your future plans for martial arts. What are you planning to do? <laughs> oh, uh, well, I have a few projects in the works. Um, I um, have been working on a uh, paper that is still not finished, um, but I'm working on a paper comparing um, the Italian Armazzare to the um, Marine Corps martial arts program. Um, which has been a real fun study because both arts are armored martial arts. And so there's a lot more in common uh, between the techniques than a lot of people would initially think about. Um, also, I, I, I think I'm going to be going to try to borrow, I'm hoping to borrow a page out of, um, I think his name's Jock, um, Jock's book where he, a lot of people have probably seen um, his video comparing a fireman, a soldier, and a knight going through uh, various obstacles and obstacle course. Um, I, my goal is to uh, continue recovering from my knee injury that I had last year, but um, to do the Marine Corps, of course, um, both in a modern military uh, kit and then also do it in medieval kit and do a compare and contrast. What do you mean like a marine armor set? This complete armor? That's one you mean, right? Well, like the, the flak jacket and the Kevlar. Oh, oh flak jacket. And then um, probably some, some of those uh, ammo pouches um, for the additional weight and encumberment and, and cumbersomeness. <laughs> of course, I understand. I, very nice, very nice. Beautiful. But, uh, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to getting back into jujitsu, hopefully in the next few months, um, getting uh, my vaccine and then trying to be responsible, but also going back to jujitsu, hopefully. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Right now in chivalry today, we're studying sword and buckler um, from the um, I-33. Oh. And that's been a lot of fun uh, when, we're safe to do things more. Um, I have a, uh, a German uh, dagger material that I'd love to teach um, at Chivalry today. So that'd be great. <laughs> Beautiful. Very nice. Very nice. Would you like to say something else to our viewers of this channel? Share something with them? Um, I'd, I'd like to share that, you know, no matter where you are in your martial arts journey, if you're uh, just starting out um, or if you're pretty experienced, it's always good to get out and train. It's, it's always a lot of fun and uh, it's always worthwhile activity to do. Thank you very much, Shannon, for being here. It was lovely having you on this channel and sharing your experience in martial arts with all of us. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too.